Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on this episode of Wandering DMs, we get to talk to Keith Amon, who's best known as the author of The Monsters Know What They're Doing. But he's here to talk about his newest book, maybe my favorite so far, How to Defend Your Lair. Uh, welcome, Keith. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, before we get into it, viewers, I just want to remind everyone that after the show, we do have our uh, patron-only private uh, after-party chat on our private Discord server. If you want to join in on that, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash wanderingdms. Any tier level will get you in, and you'll be able to join us for the after chat uh, today at 2. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. So, Keith, this is probably my... Uh, so, How to Defend Your Lair, which which I think comes out in a week or two, actually. People can pre-order it now. is probably my nine favorite days. book yeah. that you've written so far. Awesome. Just nine days away. And, it's, and partly because here on Wandering Dems, we, you know, we do like to play kind of any edition of D&D, frequently older ones. And I, I think that probably this is the most useful book you've written so far to players of different editions. So maybe tell us a little bit about what this book is and why it's different from the other stuff you've you've written to, to date. Well, to uh, to address your point first, um, this is the uh, the first book I've written that is intentionally more broadly applicable to people who play systems other than fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. So even though all of the examples that I give in the book and uh, a lot of what I talk about in the chapter on magic, for example, and in um, uh, um, how many uh, minions you can afford to have. These things, all of my examples are from D&D 5th edition, um, and some of the math is from D&D 5th edition, but the concepts that I'm introducing, the principles that I'm introducing are applicable to pretty much any system you care to use um, as long as one of your goals as a dungeon master, game master, storyteller, whatever you are calling yourself, um, is to have the world be internally consistent and, and follow your normal real-life roles of causality um, anytime you're not explicitly and intentionally breaking those rules, such as to have dragons fly and wizards to cast fireballs and so forth. Nice, nice. I could, I could, I mean, I could totally sense that. So that was one of my top questions was, was that um, uh, intentional that you, you wanted to make this useful to different editions or was that just a natural outcome of this? Particular no, I, that, that was very intense. I, I definitely wanted to do that. And I, I probably, could have even gone a little bit further with that, except that at the same time, since I know my primary audience are players of D&D 5th edition, um, I wanted to make sure that there was a lot of meat in there for them too. There definitely is. And I'll just say, like, from my, the things that struck, stuck out to me was the fact that you have this whole, you know, narrative uh, section about strate the strategy of defense and things like that. And then when you, you have this really nice set of 16 layers for the back half of the book, which are well detailed and they have wonderful maps, but you know all the fifth edition stat blocks are removed to an appendix. All the new magic items are off in an appendix. You have like difficulty levels for traps and things that are given narratively. You don't have a whole bunch of numbers baked into the text. And for me, I can right. immediately be so easy for me to draft statistics for a different edition and it was like that is that is really lovely mm -hmm. let me see let me ask this so it looks to me like you did a heck of a lot of research for this book is, is there did how much research did you do and is there like a bibliography like maybe available <laughs> online for people that want to follow up on that you know uh i went back and forth on including a bibliography originally i i fully intended to um and then somewhere along the line i um i said you know what this is this is a book for a general audience um it's not you know i'm not writing this for university of chicago press or anything like that i don't i don't need to have all of my you know reference material in the end and then sometime after the 
third proof went through and, and everything was in the can, I started to think, man, you know, maybe I should have just like done a few more inline references <laughs> and said, you know, such and such book says this and so and so book says that. And, and, you know, so I don't have anything specifically prepared. If I get a lot of people asking for stuff like that, maybe I'll throw something together at some point. Um, I will say there was some stuff that I found very difficult to research. And part of that has to do with my being marooned at home, um, you know, during the pandemic, because this, this is a pandemic book. I was, I was writing this from quarantine and I was very, very fortunate to live in the city of Chicago and have access to uh, a lot of books that I could just get delivered uh, from wherever they happened to be to my local branch library. And I could just go in, snag them, go back out. And, um, um, you know, I have, I'm a, I'm, I got my master's at the university of Illinois at Chicago. So I was able to get some things from the university library there. Um, but uh, also totally coincidentally, my landlady happens to be a reference librarian there. So that was handy too. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> We're big um, fans of librarians but, here on one hand. <laughs> Enormously helpful. But yeah. beyond that, I was pretty much like, you know, I, I had to either buy it or there was, there was no other way I could get books in. So I, I had to do everything from those particular sources. Luckily, the Chicago Public Library System is still extremely robust and 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 well functioning despite everything Rahm Emanuel tried to do to it um but uh um yeah what are so, some but of like the, what but but, the but then you know for example trying to find things about principles of polar warfare for example that was really really hard and and you know I found this guy who was like supposedly an expert in polar warfare and i kept trying to reach out to him i never got a single response from him and it was so frustrating to me because i knew he would have had the answers to everything i wanted to ask if i could have just gotten in touch with him but it just wasn't happening um so that was that was a source of frustration and that's one of the reasons why writing this book unfortunately led to a completely unplanned 13 month hiatus of my blog which I apologize deeply, heartfeltly to all of my readers for. I really did not mean to do that to you. Um, but, uh, yeah. You know, it's funny the um, when uh, the the game company uh, that I met Paul at actually the first time uh, when I landed there, we had a we had actually a collectible card game, and the very first project I worked on was an Arctic an Arctic expansion to that game. Actually, so I've. I've been mm. there, probably not in as much depth, but I've totally been there of like, what would it be like if there was like Arctic fighting for this game and had that same difficulty of uh, designing that as a matter of fact. I yeah. like, like in this book, I really like your take, your your comments on the mountain environment. I really like the fact that you like, you point out like, there's a big difference between low altitude, medium altitude and high altitude, like Everest style yeah. altitude. Which is which is something I personally struggled with in my game. Maybe talk. Maybe tell us a little bit about how that how that got in the book. I had a really really good source for that book. Um, that one was from. I'm looking for it now. Uh, oh, where is it? Did I not put that in here? Oh, I did not put that in here. Um, I had a really fantastic source for the mountain warfare. Um, I'm, I'm digging through my notes right now, trying to find this, but it looks like I did not save them in Scrivener. Um, I'll say, well, while Keith is looking for this, I'll say, uh, it was like around when we started this channel, actually, uh, my girlfriend and I took a trip to Peru to Machu Picchu and we were hiking in the mountains for about a, about a week before that. And I remember looking around, I actually have a video on the channel from that time of like, these mountains don't look anything like what I'm accustomed to in mm -hmm. you know the eastern seaboard of North America. They just look like someone oh, made yeah. this in 3D CGI because they don't look physically possible to my eyes. They're so different and how I could possibly use that in my game. 
Well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I, I'm just not finding this right now. I'll have to go back and look for it later. But um, when I was a kid, my family used to take trips out to Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, the Rockies and, and how high that altitude is, um, even where the trails begin. You know, the trails in Rocky Mountain National Park begin 2,000 feet higher than the highest mountain in the entire New York Adirondacks, which is, you know, pretty amazing to think. I mean, east of oh. Appalachia, you know, Mount Marcy is like as high as you get, and it's 5,000 feet and change. And, you know, Estes Park, Colorado is at 7,000 feet and change, and Long's Peak goes up to 14 and a half, you know, and, and even that is not in the same league as, say, the Himalayas, or like you mentioned, the Andes, um, just completely different leagues. Totally agree with that. I think that was I, I, I hadn't seen that like in a in a D and D book that observation. And I've I've hiked Mount Washington, New Hampshire, in the past, and then mm -hmm. go to the Andes and be like, wow, this is just totally this is this is a totally different situation. So I really like yeah. that um, that little piece of business. Um, if um, me, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of yeah, curious ahead, about the 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 other side of the of the research uh, side of things. I, I mean, uh, it's fantastic, uh, and it's very exciting to hear uh, about the the sort of academic uh, library research. Um, but I know you included a lot of layers in the book itself. Did you run layers through those, and was it, were there any surprises, any any uninteresting results from from that from those play tests? Well, I ran, uh, I, I ran some of those actually just recently at Gamehole Con in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I had four Bust My Lair events and ran players through the Wizard's Tower, the two Hag Lairs, and the Lich's Crypt. And uh, two parties busted the Lairs. One party ran out of time um, and was... was kind of slow going, but I think if they'd had another hour and a half or two hours, they would have succeeded in the end. Um, and then one got cornered and was completely hosed, um, <laughs> which I think is about, which I think is about the right balance, uh, honestly, because yeah. for every one of these layers, I have a recommended minimum level. Um, cause these are not easy. They're designed to be tough. Every single one of them contains somewhere in it, a, very super deadly encounter by Dungeon Master's Guide encounter building uh, rules. Um, and it lies along the main path in. Like whatever the, the owner of the lair predicts is the most likely path that people are going to come in on, that is where the deadliest encounter is. So a party has to think about how to get in via a non-obvious way. And players are creative. They will find ways to do that. And that's okay. These layers are not designed to be PC killers. They are supposed to give flavor and challenge. They are supposed to give you that sense that the owner of the lair knows what they're doing and is taking seriously the, uh, the mission of protecting their assets. And at the same time, that while they, what they've done will keep out any number of ordinary intruders, extraordinary intruders can still find a way. So, you know, it's, it's within the player's reach if they reach for it. And that's that's that kind of sweet spot of difficulty that I always like to try to hit. You know, the 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 greater the struggle, the sweeter the victory. I really feel that that is very much in the flavor of the the tournament uh, series that Paul and I were running a couple of years ago that we called the Big Bad of a big a big layer that was intended to be tough. That you know mm -hmm. we're secretly kind of rooting for the players, even though we wouldn't tell them that. Um, and you know we wanted it to be tough so that you know we could tell, like it, for, at least for that tournament situation, we could tell who won because not everybody was gonna was was supposed to win. 
um, the way we set it up. So that feels that that and your success ratio feels very familiar to what we were doing as well. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I noticed that with the, the layers, it skews uh, towards higher level stuff. Like I think out of the 16 layers, I think there's three that are recommended for below ninth level and the rest are all uh, ninth or 10th level or higher than that. Was that which for, for me, I think is very interesting because I think traditionally uh, running D&D &D at higher levels is more challenging, more difficult, more prone to, you know, pit holes for the DM. Was that intentional or was it just like higher level, these particular monsters that you were interested in were at higher levels? It wasn't really intentional. It was sort of an, well, it was an artifact of my very early choice to focus on monsters and NPCs that were likely to have lairs. Um, you know, I probably could have done something simpler on the low end too, like uh, a, a bandit stronghold or a goblin cave, something like that. Um, but goblins don't have lair actions. Bandits don't have lair actions. You know, they don't have regional effects. And and um, early on, I guess I had just kind of, without even really deeply thinking about the implications of it, um, chosen a whole roster of monsters that do have layer actions and regional effects um, because I wanted to work those into the defense and have them be an essential and organic part of the defense. Um, and so the upshot of that ended up being that there's like a third level one and a fifth level one and everything else is seventh and up. Um, I, there might be two fifth level ones, but um, but yeah, it is, it is the bulk of the 16 layers um are aimed at tier two and tier three got it got it i mean i i personally like that because i feel it's you know does the dm designing higher level stuff in D, D is the is the most is the most challenging so personally i i was excited to see your careful well-reasoned thought process for what these what these places were going to look like would it be fair so you mentioned that you you tested recently the the last right the last highest level layer the way you definitely need 20th level characters mm -hmm. going in the lich's crypt is the mm -hmm. last thing in the book would it be fair to say that this is keith Amon's take on the tomb of horrors or tomb of rehotep or necropolis <laughs> yes. i i don't think it i don't think it would be because there's there's a very fundamental difference between my lich's crypt and the tomb of horrors the tomb of horrors um or, or, you know, Tomb of Annihilation, as, as I have gone through it with my players, um, exists pretty much solely for the purpose of messing with anyone who goes there. And it, like, is inviting people to go there just so a Sararak can mess with them. I don't think I'm spoiling anything too much by saying that. Um, whereas my Lich's crypt, my Lich is named Zviaduk Vidavi. Um, Zviad is a lich with an agenda, you know, um, his agenda is he wants to kill a god as this tremendous petty act of revenge against this city state that exiled him, this, this theocratic city state. He's like, oh yeah, all right. You're going to do this to me. Wait till you see what I can do to you. And so he's got his you know, things, his assets that he is assembling and acquiring in order to accomplish that. And everything about that lair is geared toward making sure nobody gets near any of that. And mm -hmm. so there are different layers of defense because concentric defense is one of the things that I discuss uh, among the principles. Um, every layer of defense gets a little bit tougher. You know, every layer of restriction is tighter. And once you get all the way to the inside, now you're looking at stuff that is designed to deter the kinds of people who got past all the previous stuff. And that includes 
um, the heavy magic. It includes the uh, the uh, architectural decoys and um, and some of the more classic traps. But I don't I don't believe in general that traps, especially deadly traps, are particularly practical in a lair where you've got stuff going on because you don't want to trigger them yourself you don't want any of your minions to accidentally trigger a deadly trap and then oops you just lost some minions you know if you're you, good minions are hard to come by <laughs> recruitment is <laughs> difficult even so yeah. um yeah. well maybe not as difficult as it ought to be but um, <laughs> I, I just, but the, the, the you know, point I, is, I, go ahead. <laughs> well, the, the point is that um, any any trap that you're putting in a well trafficked area has to be non lethal. It has to be primarily geared toward stopping intruders by by just like caging them. Or something by immobilizing them, or or you know maybe have some some blinding smoke or knockout gas or something non lethal like that, so that if your own people stumble into it, it's just a minor inconvenience that you can easily recover from. Um, the place to put deadly traps is on vulnerable points, especially around your perimeter that you don't have the personnel to actively cover. So if if you, if there's a spot where man it's just too difficult to put place guards so that they can keep an eye on this spot all the time but it's a way people might come in by that's where you put a deadly trap um because you know none of your people are going to stumble into it the only people who will trigger that trap are ones who have no business at all being there interesting interesting and so the bulk of the traps in Zviad's lair are in places where nobody but Zviad and his bodyguard go. And they are of a nature that he can easily bypass. You know, there are like arcane locks that open for him. There are, um, there's, there's an area of poison gas that he can walk right through because he's immune mm -hmm. to poison. Uh, and mm -hmm. so is his bodyguard. Um, he can just ignore the decoys. He doesn't, pay them anymore. He set them up. He knows what they are. He doesn't pay them any more mind. Um, and so forth. I will say that um, the the very, I don't think I'm spoiling anything, uh, the very last couple pages of his lair, I have multiple little uh, head blowing up icons as I was reading <laughs> uh, parts of it here. I think, I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, and you have a little footnote here thanking uh, DM Ian Wickles for some of these particularly sinister ideas that you have to protect his most valuable asset. Mm hmm Yeah. I mean, credit where it's due because, you know, this book, really, I mean, all of the books I've written, um, I come at from the point of view not only of a teacher, but also of a student. Because um, I, I started writing the blog, The Monsters Know What They're Doing, as a way of taking readers along on my own journey to understand the game better than I did before. Um, I mean, it all began with, with my feeling like I ran this goblin combat in the Lost Minds of Fandelver, and I thought, man, that just didn't feel right. There was something missing there. I'm, I'm missing the essential goblinness of these goblins. What is it that I missed, and how can I do better the next time around? And that's when I started giving close reads to stat blocks and trying to work through the mechanical implications of every single trait, every single action, and um, coming to realize, oh, goblins are hit and run fighters. You know, so now I understand more about the goblins. Um, and uh, in this case, how to defend your lair was my deep dive into something I wanted to know more about, which was. How do people in the real world approach this 
question of how to secure a building, how to defend an area, and so forth. And um, so what you, what you, the reader, are seeing is my distillation of all the research I did to help me understand how to defend a lair. And um, in the course of the research, I found a couple of things on Reddit uh, that other people had uh, written. Uh, Jonathan Sue was the, the other um, writer that I, I credit with. Uh, he, he was the one who wrote the Reddit post talking about how to adjust your encounter difficulty for the magic items that your PCs are carrying. Um, because every 5e DM has run into this challenge of the fact that the encounter building guidelines in chapter three of the DMG are written assuming no magic items. So once the players start to accumulate magic items, especially if you're, you know, the nice Halloween hand house that hands out the full size candy bars, um, <laughs> how do you, how do you continue to challenge them? Because eventually you realize you, you get to this point where, where the PCs are winning everything in a cakewalk and you have to ratchet the difficulty higher and higher. And you're worried, right? If you, if you root for your players and you care about their PCs and the stories that everyone's trying to tell, you hit this point where, um, um, you're afraid to ratchet it up any higher because you don't want to inadvertently kill them all. And so finding that balance is a challenge. And Jonathan found what looked like a pretty good way to find that balance. And so I wanted to make sure that, that I included something about that. <laughs> uh, and then with respect to Ian Wickles, uh, he had just devoted a ridiculous, ridiculous amount of thought to what tools a lich would have at its disposal to uh, hide its soul, the vessel that it keeps its soul in. And um, the way he came up with was just so brilliant, I didn't think I could top it. So I asked him, can I include this in, in my book and credit you? And he gave me permission. That's nice. great. Nice. That's great. Yeah. That's, I mean, the, the thing that you're talking about in terms of um, adjusting difficulty based on magic items, I think really rings true to me for also, especially for high level play, right? And I seem to recall that that was the eye opener for yeah. me when Dan started running sort of higher level, especially like G series modules for us, mm -hmm. where the question started, the questions he started to have to ask were things like, is anyone not invisible? Is anyone not flying? And the answers were always, no, mm -hmm. no, we're all, we're all, we're all invisible and flying. And I'm like, oh, all yeah. right. Well, I guess that changes how this game's going to run. Yeah. Magic items and especially major magic items, um, or, or even, even minor consumables that run off charges, but that have very powerful effects. You know, you get a, a um, wand of fireballs and, you know, you're doing some wreckage. <laughs> you are you know so on page yeah, one I, right so on page one of go ahead paul oh I, w I was just gonna say i think even i would say it's even worse especially for consumable magic items when you start running games at conventions or you're running one shots rather than campaign play yeah because i feel like players in those games are very willing to just chew through those magic items yeah. right mm -hmm. i have a wand of fireballs with with 20 charges on it I feel like I haven't played this game correctly in a you know one shot convention style if I have any time <laughs> left at the end of those four hours. I you know I can well, see that's, now, that's where you create the ones that blow up when you use the last charge, but you lose right. this charge and you right. don't know exactly how many there are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and this is actually five one that I charges will... in this one or six. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel lucky? <laughs> Oops, the trap set it off. Um, you know, that's actually one that I will say, um, even not, not, not the biggest fifth edition player, but fifth edition, right, actually does have uh, a, a bit of a solution to that in that their, their wands usually only have, what, three or four charges per day is, is what it is or something like that, and then recharges daily. Yeah, they recharge so it on. That, and so if you, use, if you ever play. lose the last charge, there is a chance that they'll become inert or that they'll blow up or do something. Yeah. Exactly. 
exactly. Mm -hmm. So at least when we were when we were running our fifth edition games, you know, tournament style, people were burning through the whole wand, and we got to make that roll every single game. (laughs) 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 So on on page, I should I should mention like the the guiding principle of this particular book is you come in on page one and you say, the first thing that I would recommend you think about when you're designing a lair is what is it defending? What Number one, what are the treasures? What are the assets that you're defending? And then front load that in your design process. And then every single layer here, the very first th- section of every layer is, here's the assets in the layer. Here's what we're defending. Right. And then we're gonna think about where those things got put and how many resources were set up to defend them and um, um, and that's 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 the, the the primary thing we're thinking about first and foremost. And I right. feel like that's an interesting um, I don't know correction I guess to uh, you know Paul and I have actually done some one hour layer designs on the show in the past, and we I, I will confess have been focused on we're interested in what what characters are here, what monsters are here, what traps are here to you know possible to to challenge the players and then we actually have struggled a little bit near the end of like oh what treasures should we have put here and we kind of stumbled over that a little bit and i'll say mm-hmm. that you're you've having read this here you made me reflect on the fact that even in original D D, the as, as sketchy as it was gygax's initial advice was place the important treasures first Maybe with monsters mm. there, maybe not pr- place the treasures first and then think about the rest of it, maybe randomly generate the other monsters and minor treasures. Um, do you, did you, um, do you ever, having front loaded the issue of treasure, do you ever consider in fifth edition going back to early rules and maybe awarding experience for the treasure? Because just like in early editions where that was the emphasis, do you ever consider emphasizing that in your experience awards? No, and the reason for that is that fifth edition is so clearly uh, in its design oriented toward eliminating experience points altogether. They were just too, too chicken to pull the trigger. It's really clear from... Uh, <laughs> from no i mean seriously it's really clear we get that when you read any of the published modules that um what they really wanted fifth edition to be about was story-based leveling not experience point leveling and so i have i have just uh given in to the uh the the forces and said you know what from from now on i'm going to use story-based leveling Unless and until it becomes evident that Watsi wants to go back in the other direction again. I, I mean, seriously, I, I think that I think that the designers of Fifth Edition, everything, everything in what I've read um, that they've published, and they've they've never spoken directly of this, mm-hmm. but reading between the lines of everything they've ever published, um, it tells me they really just wanted to get rid of experience points. Um, and I think the only reason experience points are still in fifth edition is because they were afraid of Gronyard backlash. Um, they were afraid of the backlash from, from old school players. It would have been like if they had gotten rid of three to 18 ability scores and just gone with the ability score modifiers, uh, which I think maybe they also wanted to do, or if they had, um, uh, if or if they had thrown alignment out the window from the get go, um, which now they're doing in fits and starts, but you know you can you can tell it's hard to let go. It's it's hard. I mean these are these are legacy aspects of the game that a lot of people, including me, are very attached to. Um, if if five e had come out from the get go and said there are no more experience points. Um, it's all story based leveling now. I would I would have been hmm, okay, bold choice, but I would have gone along with it. But if fifth edition had thrown out alignment or thrown out three to eighteen ability scores, um, I would have been I would have been seriously asking, is this even D D anymore? Um mm-hmm. 
And I'm, I'm glad they kept those things because for me, they give that feeling of continuity. Um, experience points I care less about because, you know, D and D is the reason I drifted away from D and D in the first place, back on the cusp of second edition, when I was still playing a D and D and into other games like Shadowrun is that D and D for me felt too heroic. It felt like it made PCs, especially high level PCs, too indestructible. This idea that your dwarf fighter could um, fight a dozen orcs, drink a glass of poison, jump off a cliff, pick himself up, dust himself off at the bottom and fight another dozen orcs and still be feeling pretty good um, was just like, I, you know, I liked Shadowrun where everyone has 10 hit points and it might be easier or harder to take those 10 hit points away from you, but if you lose them all, you're dying. And, um, you know, since I have come back to 5th edition, I'm like, okay, this game is a power fantasy, so embrace the power fantasy. Roll with it. Enjoy it for what it is. This is what it's trying to do. It does it successfully. So let's just take it as a given that it's worth doing and have as much fun with it as we can. And uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying to bring as much verisimilitude to my games as I can, because that to me is part of the fun of having this interconnected world where causality rules and stuff is always going on in the background, even when the PCs aren't looking um, and every monster and every villain and every NPC and innocent bystander has their own life and their own motivations and their own business that they're going about. Um, you don't really need experience points for any of that. You know, story-based leveling is fine. It makes sure that the PCs are getting stronger when it feels right for them to get stronger. And you're not having these struggles where, um, like, uh, you know, man, it really feels like they should be going from level 8 to level 9 right now. But they're still 1,400 experience points short. Random bugbears, you know, I mean, it's not relevant to the story. It breaks immersion. So, you know, I think so that, go um, with the you story. know, I think... I think Paul and I, I think, agree that we've 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 sensed the um, the fifth edition of designers would have liked to have gone full story uh, reward mode. I think we've we've Paul and I have probably talked about that before, that that we were wondering if that was the case. Um, I feel like maybe you know even if it wasn't intended, I think some of us interpret the um, you know the early editions giving experience uh, at least half or majority through treasure as some kind of of story award one could possibly interpret is like the story here is your, you know, near do well mercenaries and you're, you know, greedy and that's mm -hmm. how you, um, and I, I think af af effectively that's how early editions really worked is you were looking for the big score and ultimately that's how you were going to score your level up. So whether, you know, mm -hmm. intended or not, I could imagine, I could imagine uh, a fifth edition DM that wanted to run that way saying the big, asset scores that's the story reward that's where the story reward kicks in when you get the giant uh the giant asset and again i gotta praise i gotta praise this book you have a whole system for measuring so on the one hand you know what you want to get away from the detailed experience points but you have a very detailed method here for measuring the value of different assets. So you've got like yeah, I found I, it, I found a use for them since nobody's using them for level advancement anymore. Let's at least <laughs> use XP as sort of a measure of um, how powerful a creature is, and by extension, how many of this creature can you get to come work for you, or at least you know live in the woods and harass trespassers on your behalf. And um, and there's that. Yep. And I like that. And you also have the method of actually measuring the value of the assets. 
um, mm -hmm. on a on a zero to four scale in a bunch of different categories that I thought was interesting. Was that completely novel, or did you pick that up from some other source? I picked that up from one of the um, sources that I used, which was a uh, textbook from the uh, American Institute of Architects on building security. I mean, I, I think the title was literally just building security or principles of building security, something, you know, right there on the label. Um, that book used a scale from one to five, which I originally did too. And then with after some back and forth with my editor, um, we agreed that uh, a lot of players are going to trip over the idea of having no value or negligible value be assigned one. So we rescaled it from zero to four, um, which uh, unfortunately resulted in a couple of errors that made it into the first printing of the book. Um, when, when I give the first example of the, uh, the, uh, the crime ring, the affinity, uh, valuing their assets, there are a couple of sevens in there that should be eights and they got fixed in the second proof but got reverted in the third so uh <laughs> yeah that that hurts a but little bit but i think bit. it was i think it was um, but, right but it's not it's actually. nothing yeah I, yeah, I saw that. I, you mentioned that switch, actually. I think it was the right choice. Uh, Paul and I both being computer guys, we approve starting your count from zero. And I, I totally mm -hmm. agree. A, a, value, a valueless asset feels like you ought to be looking at a score of zero. So I personally yeah. um, thought that was a wise choice, as a matter of fact, for that, that asset valuing system. And those zero to fours are relative values. They're rough. They're... Mm -hmm. they're um, you know, largely based on on hunch and feeling. Um, the only place where they really and I don't I don't actually this is kind of a behind the scenes thing. I don't really discuss this in the book, but I started thinking about relative valuation of magic items and the fact that I've got this zero to four scale and those correspond pretty neatly to common, uncommon, rare, very rare, legendary. And so I started using the magic item tiers as a sort of unofficial yardstick for everything else. So the operational or the monetary value of a magic item is tied to its rarity. Well, then the operational value or the monetary value of certain other non-magical assets could be in proportion to how much money a magic item of a particular rarity is worth. So like if I'm doing a monetary asset, I might say anything up to 50 gold pieces is zero, 50 to 500 is one, 500 to 5,000 is two. Uh, but it, you don't have to do it that way. Um, mm -hmm. You don't even have to do it the same way from layer to layer to layer. The only thing that's important is that you're internally consistent within the layer you're designing right now. And because what it does, the final number you arrive at for each asset doesn't matter. What matters is the order they end up in. What is the most valuable according to these, these different metrics? What's the least valuable? And then you start at the top you start with the most valuable thing and say how vulnerable is this how critical is it and your answer to that question tells you how many resources do i need to expend to protect this thing and then you go down to the next asset and ask the same questions and then you go down to the next asset and the next to the next and in all likelihood you will reach a point where you've run out of resources and you have to say well i guess the measures that I've put into place to protect all these other things are going to have to do for these things as well. Um, because resources are not infinite. Time is not infinite. Your intelligence is not infinite. Building security and area defense are never a matter of eliminating risk. They're always a matter of managing risk and trying to make sure that you are keeping the most likely negative events from happening. That's where you put the bulk of your attention, the bulk of your effort, the bulk of your resources. And then you still account for less likely situations, but you don't have as much to pour into those. You're gambling. You know, you're saying, 
the odds of this kind of attack are very high. I'm going to make very sure that doesn't happen. The odds of this kind of attack are pretty low. I'm going to make some gestures toward making sure that this doesn't happen. And, you know, making sure that if it does happen, I know about it quickly. But beyond that, I don't have anything else to spare. I love that analysis. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, Keith, um, I just wanted to, I, I'm curious if you ever dealt with the situation where you have um, the thing that the villain or is, is valuing, the, the, whatever that is, uh, and protecting in the lair is perhaps different from the thing that the players are after. So just thinking back yes. to our original discussion. No, absolutely, yes. Point. And you have to, as yeah. the owner yeah. of the lair, you have, to, you have to see the value of anything, any asset, through your enemy's eyes, as well as your own. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if you're not sure which way to go, you err in the direction of what is this worth to my enemy? Because there might be something that I consider moderately valuable. There are other things I care about more, but this one thing that I consider moderately valuable is irresistibly tempting to a lot of other people. So it's going to be more likely that they're going to come at me for this. Mm -hmm. That's going mm -hmm. to lead me to that's going to lead me to put a little bit more protection on that thing. You know, even though even though I don't care about it as much, I know that it's going to result in people testing me. And so I have to make sure that that, 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 you know, that gets them nowhere and doesn't cost me anything. Because I also have to account for the possibility that if they came in looking for this thing that I moderately care about, but it's tempting lots of people into trying to make runs at me, sooner or later, one of them might get in, might find something that I really value more than this. Right and decide opportunistically that they want to snag that too. So um, the thing that is going to be the greatest temptation to get people to try to invade your lair is something that you're going to have to put a lot more detection and deterrence on. Nice, nice. Yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed seeing how you, how you deal with that there. Um, and, and I should say, you know, what a great, um, you know, multitude of different settings, actually. So you have, you know, I could tell that you have the narrative section of defense principles, and then more or less, you tried to, you tried really hard to give an example of all that stuff in your various layers. So you have things said in the, the woods and the mountains and the jungles, and there's an underwater yeah. layer, and there's a flying palace layer, and there's multiple dragon lairs, one of which controls a city in the desert. And I just, I just thought it was like a marvelous variety of different places that you could be adventuring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I mean, you know, after I left AD and D, I landed in Shadowrun. So you could you could take the same set of ideas and apply it to a Shadowrun game or a cyberpunk game. You could apply it to a science fiction game set on a space station. Uh, which is a very interesting terrain, by the way. You can't run uh, <laughs> unless there's, you know. I guess if if you have escape pods, um, but you're not, you're not, you're not going for a walk outside. Um, you know, superhero games, whatever. You can take these same ideas and apply them. But yeah, Definitely. I. But but the uh, in terms of using the principles to design the layers, absolutely. I went through my own process for every single one of those layers, and then I, um, and then I wrote up a list of requirements for each layer, things that that the layer owner would have to do in order to follow these principles. And then I went to my cartographers, who, by the way, shout out to my four amazing cartographers, without whom this book would not have been possible. Um, Dungeon Baker, Chloe Bolland, Fernando Salvatera, um, reclusive cartographer. Um, I gave them the specs for each layer and said, this is what it needs to include. And in some cases, I drew like a rough sketch of what I had in mind. And in some cases, I just gave them like some Pinterest links and said, go to town. Um, and, uh, and they did a lot of the design. 
You know, they, they um, did a lot of the actual architecture and then they would give it back to me and I would look it over to make sure everything was consistent. I'd send notes back to them and we'd go back and forth and fine tune. Um, these, these layers are, are their creations as much as they are mine. I mean, big ups to those map makers um, and they're beautiful to boot. So um, they, are, they are treasures. Everyone, those are those four cartographers I, ne I named. Um, if you need someone to draw a map for you, go to them. They're great. They look great. I got to admit, they look great. It was a pleasure every time I got to. And there's a lot of maps. Like every layer, like sometimes has three or four or five maps or something like that. And it looks great. And it's just so enjoyable when I hit all those pages. And I'll say, you know, clearly uh, refined, clearly well considered. Um, I was trying to catch mistakes, frankly. I th you have a part of the Lich's Crypt has a very specific piece of geometry, I'll say, on the front entryway that's important. Mm -hmm. And I thought that I was catching a, a mistake in the, ge in, the, in the conical area geometry. And I was like, nope, 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 this makes sense. Oh it's my God, perfect. that freaking conic <laughs> section. I yes. broke my brain I making that. sure that that conic section was in the I, right place. I totally <laughs> see that. I totally got that. I was like, ah, this seems tricky. I don't know. And I was like, my God, Keith totally mm. got that exactly right. Yep. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but boy, the pain well involved, the pain. Every once in a while, every once in a while, you know, my, my readers know, I'll, I'll do a lot of math for them. Every once in a while, the lifting becomes very heavy. I totally see that. I totally have a bunch of margin notes about double checking that and like, mm, yeah, all right. All right. I see that. Keith really put the homework mm. in. Absolutely. I'm, I really I'm getting tired that. right now just thinking about that conic section. At, as someone that works as a math professor for his day job, I really respect having that work, having, having your stuff backed up by that amount of work. I can totally see that. Absolutely. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a happier, uh, more, more uh, lighthearted note, there are a ton of Easter eggs in this book if people care to look for them. I agree. I, you know, I love Keith. I love your writing. You, you are like you and John Peterson are my top two D and D writers, frankly. And the amount of uh, care and love for you know the words for the sentence construction that you're putting on the page, and the 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 verbal wit and the deep cut allusions in places. <laughs> To, to someone who is an old school gamer is is really uh, is really really lovely. There's a point I think with the I think it's in the narrative section where you say, oh, make sure you have uh, if you're in an urban area and like four I think of your layers are in urban areas. If you're in or urban area, make sure you have an escape. You can escape into the sewers and you could escape into a maze of a maze of twisty little passages all alike and get away from yeah, your enemies. And I was go. like, that's great. I love that. To death. <laughs> um, you know, and little comments like, um, you know, they're in the uh, in the in the drow layer, um, you know, and you you get all kinds of interesting details from, you know, actual uh, real world underground cities that you pulled in there. And there's a point where you say, yeah. as in most tyrannies, the, the tyrannical leader has no clear successor. So if they get eliminated, mm -hmm. the whole thing's going to go into chaos. I was like, that is a lovely hard little nugget of real world fact that got yeah. thrown in there. And I, I really enjoy seeing those, those little pieces when you, when you write them in your case. Wonderful, yeah, it's, wonderful it's writing. Interesting. It's interesting. Thank you. It's interesting because um, while I did do a lot of, of research and very intentional directed research, um, there are some things that made it into the book out of just other stuff that I happened to be reading at the time. I was reading the book uh, Corruptible. Um, I think the subtitle is Who Gets Power and How It Changes Them by Brian Claus, K-L-A-A-S, um, which, as you might imagine, is, is mostly about politics and, and uh, you know, workplace sociology and that kind of thing. But um, I, I was reading this while I was writing the book, and I got to a part where he was talking about uh, loyalty and saying that if you have a workforce and you are always assigning people to the exact same jobs you're creating opportunities for corruption either because you're giving someone the scut work all the time 
and they are building up resentment and losing loyalty towards you and are looking for a way to say, screw this guy. Or you might be putting someone in too sensitive a position too often, and it becomes uh, the case that they are the ones who get the sense of how valuable this thing really is. They are the ones who know all the ins and outs of how it's protected. They're the ones who notice the little gaps in protection. And they are the ones who they become the weak links because somebody comes along and offers them a suitably enticing bribe. They know too much. And so one of the things you need to do is rotate people around constantly through the various tasks to make sure that the, the sweet tasks and the bitter tasks are um, evenly given to everybody so that so everyone can at least see that you're being fair. Um, do integrity checks from time to time. And then, you know, when you test someone and they prove that they are loyal, reward them for that. And these are the ways that you keep your workforce loyal, you know, that you keep their morale high. And I thought, you know, I wasn't thinking about this before, but this belongs in the book because this is useful stuff. <laughs> Having disloyal employees especially like disloyal security guards is a huge vulnerability if if you have disloyal people working for you that can undermine every other protective measure that you've taken that's a that's a key insight that is a key nugget of wisdom and so i made sure that that got into the book Great, nice. I love, and that's just one little gem that Keith puts in there, and I, I love that plus everything else so much. Thank we you. are just about out of time here, Keith. I wanted to ask: Is there anything about the book uh, that we didn't get out that uh, our viewers should know about uh, how to defend your lair? Um. Well, uh, aside from the fact that it comes out November twenty ninth, uh, January eighth in the UK. Uh, but it will be available in ebook format in the UK on November 29th. Um, bookstores everywhere. Um, you can find links on my website, spyandowl.com, all spelled out. And um, if your friendly local game store wants to carry it, I believe uh, ACD is stocking it. Um, and uh, if they don't deal with ACD, they can get it wholesale from Simon & Schuster Distribution. We have a link to Spy and Owl in the YouTube description right now. So if people want to go there and pre-order uh, How to Defend Your Lair from Keith, uh, you can do that right now. Thanks. You know, let me say, I'll just, as, as some parting thoughts, I, um, you know, I, I'll say again, for me, this was my favorite book that Keith's written to date. And, um, and I've seen all of them because Keith's publisher sent over the whole, the whole <laughs> library the other day. Um, and I will point out that um, the next time we run The Big Bad, I'm going to be particularly well, <laughs> I'm going to be completely well researched uh, for, for how to punish the players. But this book, I, I do feel intentional or not, is, is the most useful for old school players. And, uh, you know, maybe it's a coincidence or maybe just great minds think alike of emphasizing the treasure up front, explaining how important it is for scouting, which I feel explains wandering monsters and um, having uh, this, this and, and having the, the wonderful layers that you could totally use in any version of D&D. And whether, and, and Keith, Keith can resist this, but I'm going to think of the Lich's Crypt at the end as, as his reversal of the Tomb <laughs> of Horrors. And I personally love all the layers, but that one most of all. So I, I personally adore this book and people should read it. Excellent. Uh, viewers, again, if you are looking for those links of where to get uh, Keith's book, you can find them here in the uh, description of the YouTube video. Um, if you have it and you've read it and you have some thoughts to share, please leave us some comments here, uh, right here in the video. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and uh, maybe that will spur future conversations here at Wandering DMs.
Yeah, definitely. And remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs. We are on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, because we're coders, TikTok by the handle Wandering DMs. So look for us there, and you'll see updates on future shows and future guests. And the next time, Keith is on, too. If you prefer to listen to our shows in audio-only podcast format, you can find those shows on our website at wanderingdms.com. You can also find us on various podcast carriers such as iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts. If you are listening to this show right now on one of those carriers, uh, please take a moment to rate and review us there on that site. That helps other users of that site find our show, and we really appreciate it. We really do. And of course, enormous thanks to our patrons who support the show. If you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs and you'll see our different tiers, rebates on merch that we have. We just updated our website and our store as a matter of fact, and access to our Discord server where we continue the conversations all the time. We'll be there in about 10 minutes, like Paul said at the top of the show, to continue this conversation live uh, by video. And I'm sure our viewers have a lot of great ideas about how to defend their layers. Uh, and things that they're designing. Uh, we'll all be there. Paul, you and I will both be there today, Paul. Is that right? Great, great. Absolutely. Uh, look for look for upcoming shows uh, in the next week on Wandering Ams. I'll be back tomorrow, Monday night, for more AD&D Pool of Radiance action as I do a um, <clears throat> slow run through that, through that classic game. And then we'll actually be on Thanksgiving night. If you're looking for some kind of sporting event, but you're not into football or something like that, uh, check in Thursday night for some more Book of War wargaming action here um, at Wandering DMs uh, Central. Uh, Keith, thank you enormously for making time to talk about uh, your latest book. Always like to hear your thoughts, and thank you for, for thank you for making this. It's, it was a joy to read. Thanks so much for inviting me. I love coming on here. That's the best. Don't forget, we are live every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, so please join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.